Okay, so um, let's uh, do this uh, from the beginning. I will uh, try to do it differently so that it's not so annoying. Um, but no, this is not working. Oh, okay. Um, so I will talk about some integral differential models of, uh, of, two, um, of evolutionary adaptation of uh, populations. Uh, in changing environments and we will try to see how to model uh, and how to analyze and describe the dynamics of populations in changing environments in the point of view of evolution. How the genetic structure or phenotypic structure of a population would evolve uh, in a changing environment. Okay? And I will start with um, some biological examples, uh, so biological motivations. And um, the first one is a um, classical uh, problem of um, global change. And in particular, the fact that the tem temperature on Earth is increasing. I think that this week we are uh, experiencing a particular example of that. <laughs> and um, okay, so uh, what happens is that he here in this figure uh, we see uh, uh, the average temperature of, uh, on Earth uh, since 1880, and we see that uh, um, since like 1980s, we are having uh, an increase of the temperature. And uh, so it is almost linear, but there are also some fluctuations, some oscillations, of course, because there are seasonal effects, but it, there, there are also some uh, stochastic effects that makes that, well, sometimes like Last year, the temperature in summer was not very high, but this year it's uh, particularly warm, and in average, it is increasing. Okay? And then wh we could wonder under which conditions um, with such, such a change of uh, environment, the t for, for instance, the temperature, the species uh, will be able to adapt uh, by the Darwinian evolution uh, to the uh, environment so that uh, they would survive and uh, that they would not get extinct. And um, another question that we could ask is that uh, how these oscillations uh, are important? Uh, uh, what are the impacts of these oscillations on the adaptation of the population to a changing environment, to a, an environment that is anyhow changing gradually, but it is also having some oscillations. And what are the um, impact of those oscillations on this, um, on the dynamics of the populations? Okay. Um, a second example is, um, um, concerns a biological experiment uh, and some bacteria. Um, the biologists in these experiments, uh, uh, what they did is that they kept a population of bacteria in, um, I mean, two um, populations of bacteria which were uh, initially genetically identical. They kept them in two different environments. They kept them, uh, one of them in a constant environment where the temperature was kept equal to 31 degrees, constant temperature in one environment, and uh, an oscillating uh, temperature in the second environment where the temperatures were, were varying between 24 and 38 in a periodic way, okay? So a daily uh, periodic uh, change of uh, temperature. So what they did is that they kept these two populations, which were initially identical for a long time, for several weeks. And then at the end of the experiment, they sampled those populations, which had evolved in two different environments. And what they observed, uh, what they did is that they measured the growth rate of such populations in different situations. And in particular, in different environments, uh, in different temperatures. For instance, in temperature 24, um, in temperature 24, uh, 31 and 38. Okay? And what they observed is that, uh, they observed that the population that had evolved in a periodic environment is the one in gray, um, a dark uh, gray, and uh, uh, they had 
generally a better perform performance than the population that evolved that evolved in the periodic environment. Okay, so what they did is that they had two populations and two environments. So environment constant thirty one and environment uh, periodic. 24 and 38 degrees with an average 31. And they, s they had uh, some population here and some population there and they kept these population for a long time in these two environments and then they uh, took some samples And they put them in an environment, for instance, which, which was 24 degrees or 31 degrees or um, 38 degrees, okay? And uh, they measured how they population, uh, the, these samples would grow in these three environments, okay? And what they observed is that the population that he had evolved in, in, uh, in this environment had a better growth rate in these three situations, okay? And also in other, uh, they had uh, studied other scenarios, but I will concentrate on these situations, okay? So, um, there's something that is uh, a little bit surprising in this result is that um, a population that evolves <laughs> in a certain environment uh, of temperature 31, for instance, when it remains for a long time in, in this environment, in this particular environment, because of natural selection, the fact that uh, we have mutations and natural selection, we would expect that if we wait long enough, the population would be... Uh, very adapted to this environment because the best traits that are well adapted to this environment would be selected, okay? While a population that has evolved in temperatures 24, uh, I mean, in a varying temperature, we would expect it to be more generalist. So it's, it, it, ha it would have a growth rate that is, uh, um, I mean, it, ha it, ha it would have some gen genotypes, phenotypes which are more adapted to different temperatures, okay? So we could ex expect that it, is, ha it has better performance, for instance, at temperature 30 war at 24, but at temperature 31, it's a little bit surprising because, I mean, we would expect that this one would be uh, the best, okay? So this, then a question that we could ask is that, okay, so why is that happening and uh, is it possible to observe also such phenomenon uh, by a mathematical model, okay? And in general, we could uh, wonder what would be the impact of an oscillating environment on the phenotypic structure of, uh, of a population. And uh, the question, the second question is the one that I asked at the first, is that, is, is it possible that a population that has evolved in a periodic environment would be better than a population that has evolved in temperature constant in this, when they, we put them in the same temperature, this would outperform this one, okay? So these are some questions that we will try to answer during uh, the lecture with uh, mathematical models. Okay, so, um, so let's uh, see first if we want to model such type of phenomena, uh, the, the evolutionary dynamics of a population, which type of mechanisms we, are, we have to take into account, okay? So first of all, we will be interested in, um, in our modeling point of view, we will be interested in quantity, quantitative traits, okay? So more phenotypes like the uh, the size of an individual at, at the adult age, or uh, for instance, the resistance of bacteria to, to, 
to the uh, medications or stuff like that. But some, something uh, uh, quantitative uh, with a continuous variable, okay? And um, so several mechanisms would contribute to the dynamics, evolutionary dynamics of a population. And the ones that we will take into account here are the followings. First of all, we will consider asexual reproduction, for instance, uh, bacteria or uh, viruses. And um, of course, we, think we take into account heredity, the fact that the uh, genetic information would uh, be transferred to the, uh, to the offspring from the parents. And um, also, we have some mutations which generate some variability in the phenotype or the, in the genes. And we consider, we take into account selection. So what I mean by selection, I mean that different uh, individuals with different traits, they would have different growth rates. Uh, and uh, at least when we consider a constant environment, we would expect that uh, the, the, indi the individual that has a better growth rate would uh, uh, grow, up, grow better and it would be uh, selected in long time um, in, uh, in the population. So that would lead to uh, the selection of the best adapted traits, okay? And we also take into account the competition between the individuals that, uh, for instance, competition for a bounded resource and um, when we assume that the resources are limited, this generally leads to the fact that the population would be of a bounded size. So these are the mechanisms that we take into account uh, here. And then what we will try to do is to predict the evolutionary dynamics uh, and evolutionary and the joint evolutionary and demographic dynamics of the population uh, depending on the trade-offs between uh, these mechanisms, okay? Okay, so I uh, begin by um, a very uh, classical model uh, of quantitative traits, which is called the continuum of alleles model. Um, so for the moment, I will concentrate on constant environments. And um, so this model was uh, introduced by Kimura in 1965, and then it was uh, rigorously derived from individual-based models by uh, Champagne, Ferrière, and Meliard in 2008. Um, so here, um, M corresponds to the phenotypic density. So Z is, um, sorry, Z is the phenotypic trait and M is the phenotypic density uh, of individuals with trait Z at, Z at time T. Okay? So this equation describes the dynamics of this phenotypic density. Uh, which depends on, uh, so which can vary with these two uh, terms at the right. The first term corresponds to the mutations. So what is uh, this term? It, um, B of Y would be the mutation rate, so let me uh, write this. BTM equal b of y, g of y minus z, m of t and y dy, plus m of t and z, r of z and i of t. And here i of t is an integral term which is given by some function p of y, m of t of y, dy. Okay, so here z is the tra trait 
M is the phenotypic density, so the phenotypic trait. So this P of Y is the birth rate leading to mutations. So we don't have always mutations, of course. Uh, there's a small probability in general of mutation. And here this would be a birth rate with mutation. And G of Y minus Z is... Uh, so G, dy gives the law of uh, uh, mutation distribution, okay? Probability of going uh, mutation from, from y to z. So this describes the probability density of mutation from uh, y to z, okay? And then, so this whole term corresponds to the mutations. And then we have a second term which includes both selection and competition. Let's first forget about I of T. I of T is an environmental feedback that um, uh, models the competition. But without this I of T, we just have a dependence on Z. And it, it, de it depends that, so this is the clonal growth rate, so the birth rate without mutations minus death rate of individuals with trait Z. And the fact that this R of Z is not a constant, but it depends on Z, uh, this is uh, how we uh, model selection. Okay, and then we have this integral term I of T, which is an environmental feedback. Um, which is given by uh, this integral. So Y could be uh, in RD or R, depending on what uh, z we, describe, uh, we take. And um, C, of, C of y is a, um, is a nice function which, is, which could be smooth and it takes its values, it takes only positive values, okay? So it is bounded by two constants. And what does it describe? It could be, for instance, um, be interpreted as the consumption rate of a certain nutrient, okay? So C of Y would be how the trait Y consumes the nutrient, and integral of Psi of Y, M of T of Y, DY would give the total consumption of the population, okay? And R of Z and I would be a function of that, and it would be a decreasing function. So R would have this property, that its derivative is negative with respect to i, and this is of course uh, to take into account that this is indeed a competition. If the consumption becomes more important, then the growth rate will decay, will decrease, okay? So um, in this way, we uh, take into account the, uh, the competition between indiv individuals, in this case for a single resource. And some examples of such a uh, growth rate. The first one is the logistic growth, where we have that uh, our function is given, uh, capital R of ZI is given by some function R of Z, which is the gross intrinsic growth rate, minus kappa I. Here we are assuming that there is a uniform competition between the all the individu individuals, psi is equal to one everywhere, and um, we have a logistic growth, it means that the total size of the population is, um, I mean the growth rate is given by some, in, uh, some intrinsic growth rate minus the size of the population, okay? Um, 
Another example is the case of chemostat, where we have a, um, a device which is called the chemostat, and in this chemostat there's some bacteria, for instance, which are, um, and the environment is very well mixed. And we inject some nutrients um, with a constant rate, and there is also um, a, uh, a, uh, uh, the nutrient and the bacteria would uh, exit from um, a part of the device with a constant rate as well, okay? And uh, if we assume that, the f so it is, I mean, I'm going a little bit fast, you can write some dynamics for, for instance, if M is the dynamics of the bacteria, and uh, um, and I is the dy dynamics of the resource. Uh, we can write some dynamics for these. D over dt of these. And the growth rate of M would depend on this resource. And if we assume that the dynamics of the nutrient is fast, then we would obtain some function that is written here, which we see that it is also decreasing function of i, because we have one over d plus i, um, but it is not linear with respect to i, so this is also a very natural uh, growth rate that we could consider in the case of chemostat. But actually the competition could be much more complex. When we take just one integral parameter here, we are somehow assuming that there is just one limiting factor as uh, uh, in the environment, for instance, a nutrient. Uh, we could be in the situations where there are several resources, and then we would have uh, several, for instance, a, a possibility is to have several integral terms. Okay, and this would lead to more complex dynamics. Another very um, common growth rate that uh, people consider is that is, um, is not in this form, but uh, it's uh, in a convolution term. So it is linear, but um, so it is in the form of R of Z. So in a type of growth rate which is not of this form, would be given by R of Z minus some convolution term, C of X, Y, M of T, Y, D, Y. Which means that the trait Y is in competition with trait X, so this is, um, sorry, this is Z. So this would be what would replace R of Z, I, okay? And, um, we would have R of Z minus this convolution term C of Z, Y, M, T of Y, which means that the trait Z and the trait Y are in competition with uh, each other, and uh, this competition is proportional to C of Z and Y, okay? And we generally, we could, for instance, take this as C of Z minus Y and take it, for instance, as a Gaussian to say that the closer traits have more competition with each other. For, exam for example, if uh, we are in the situation of bears with, um, uh, with their backs, the size of their backs, the phenotype, if they have the size of the backs that are close to each other, they would um, likely use similar resources, so they will be more competing together. And this would uh, describe such, such type of situations. Okay, and it's more adapted to stations where we have uh, many resources, okay? So, um, so this is a general fast introduction to such a type of uh, integral differential models uh, to study uh, selection and mutation for asexual populations. 
And uh, actually, um, I can still give another uh, example. So I, I, I um, presented here different possibilities of modeling the growth rate, the selection or, and competition. And um, it is also, uh, there are also some variants to model the mutations. And a simple variant of that is where we replace this integral term that I wrote here. I just replace it by a simple diffusion. Okay? And um, this, uh, for instance, of course, here I, I lose the dependence on y. I'm supposing the mutation rate is, is constant. And of course, this is not always a good uh, approximation of this uh, integral term. But it is shown that uh, in some situations where the mutations are rather frequent, but they have a small effects, the, then these, uh, this model is a good approximation of what happens of the individual based model. Okay, and uh, this is actually, uh, this was already uh, introduced in the paper of Kimura, but uh, it was uh, also uh, proved rigorously in the paper of Champagne, Perrier, and Melea. Okay. So, um, for the rest of my lectures, I will concentrate on a very simple model. Actually, the simplest model among what I showed here, which is this one, um, where I take a diffusion term for the mutations and I take a logistic growth rate, okay? The only thing that I include is that now I have an environment state, which is called E, and my growth rate will depend on, on E, okay? So this is the main equation that we will be studying. and I will take it in 1D, okay? So my objective is not to show you, uh, I mean, I just want to give the main ideas of the methods that I will introduce. Uh, a lot of parts, uh, uh, um, an important part of those uh, methods can be also applied to uh, these more uh, complex models. In particular, uh, almost all of them could apply to, uh, an important part of them could be applied to such type of uh, mutation kernels. But um, where it would be more difficult when you consider uh, this type of growth rates, okay? So these type of growth rates are uh, less uh, understood. But, of course, we can do uh, some, uh, s some stuff, but there are less uh, results uh, for this type of models than, the, uh, than the, the first ones. Okay? So, now I would like to give you also, I mean, this is, uh, so I didn't talk about this function R of E of Z, and uh, what does it look like? The most, um, important assumption that we will make on R of E of Z is that uh, it is bounded from above and um, to avoid some technical things we will assume that this will go to minus infinity when Z goes to infinity but it is not necessary okay so this could be some function like this Okay, so this is R. 
something that is bounded from above and it goes to minus infinity at infinity. But uh, as I said, uh, I don't really need to assume, I mean, for most of the result, I don't really need this, but I will say a uh, wedding tap is. And of course, a very uh, typical example is just a quadratic function. And this is uh, actually uh, something that uh, the quadratic uh, case is uh, very uh, well studied in the biological community and uh, it is known as Fisher geometrical model. where you take uh, r of e of z to be uh, some function, some constant r minus some constant s times z minus theta squared. And then, so what are the significance of these, uh, these constants? Little r is the maximal growth rate of individuals, okay? So uh, when you are the best adapted, your growth rate is equal to little r. So this is little r. So this is the maximal growth rate. This is theta, which is the optimal trait, the best trait in the environment. And then S measures how flat is this curve. So it's, uh, it is related to the curvature. And it, uh, it shows how strongly we are selecting around the trait theta of e. So it is uh, known as the selection pre pressure, okay? It is called selection pressure. Okay, of course here we, are, we want to make uh, uh, all these parameters depending on the environment. So these, function, these constant would depend on E. And we will consider different types of environment changes. We will consider um, uh, a shifting environment. So what, what do I mean by a shifting environment? Is when <coughs> R of E of T and Z is nothing but R of Z minus C T. Okay, so it's, it's, it means that if we, uh, we were, for instance, in the case of quadratic, we are, we are not, of course, going to consider only quadratic things, but it is uh, nice to have this example. It means that this theta of E would be uh, theta zero uh, plus CT. Okay? You can say E of T is equal to T and theta zero would be uh, theta, theta uh, and theta of E would be theta zero plus C. Okay? So it means that the max, the optimal trait is moving uh, with a constant speed. So if the growth rate is more general, it's like this. At, at, at uh, time t naught, at, t, at time t naught plus t, the growth rate would move to the right, okay? And we will have uh, this uh, graph for r, okay? So the growth rate is going to the right. And this is something that uh, uh, has been uh, considered a lot in uh, theoretical biology literature. Th this is usually uh, uh, the, a main assumption that what is really changing is the optimal trait because of the environment, okay? They don't uh, usually uh, uh, vary uh, different other parameters. Okay, and a second example would be this case of oscillating environment where this function E is a periodic function and then all the parameters uh, of the model or this function R of E of Z, is, uh, e of Z is a general function of a periodic variable and Z. And then we will mix it, we will uh, have a a shifting and oscillating environment. This is more motivated by the first question that I asked to you when we have a gradual change, but also oscillations. So this is why we will, this is uh, what we will study in the third example is that where we have this shift 
of the growth rate, but also some oscillations in the whole uh, graph. Okay? And then if we have time, we will also study a completely different environment where we have a piecewise constant environment. Okay? So, uh, so um, just it's piecewise constant. Okay, so, um, so the, my, my lectures are um, mostly based on uh, some works of uh, Suzeli Figueroa Iglesias, who did her PhD with me, and uh, he def she defended uh, her PhD in 2019. And also the work of uh, Christe de Chegaray, who, uh, uh, who was uh, in a postdoc with me, and uh, Manon Costa. Uh, okay, Manon Costa is in uh, Toulouse, uh, in the Institute of Math of Toulouse. Suzeli uh, Figueroa is now, uh, uh, anymore, he, she's not anymore in academia, but she works in, um, in a company uh, where uh, she uh, works in uh, mathematical modeling for biology and medicine. Uh, and Christelle uh, Chegara is in Inria in Bordeaux. And a um, and, um, big part of my talk, I will uh, use an approach which is based on Hamilton Jacobi equations. And this approach uh, was uh, introduced by, uh, uh, in 2005 by Dickman, Jaban, Michler, and Pertin. And then it was, uh, so this was the idea, came uh, first at this paper. And then the, the approach was uh, widely developed to study uh, models in uh, evolutionary biology. I have put uh, some uh, references here, the first references, but there have been actually many others. And uh, it has become actually very popular in, uh, in this field. And, um, Actually, an objective of my lecture is to introduce this approach via this example of changing environments. And um, so the, a good thing with the examples that I have chosen is that these are rather simple examples where everything is nice and we can uh, almost compute everything. So, uh, so, so it allows to see uh, what type of results we can get. Of course, uh, when we cannot compute everything explicitly, we can all still obtain uh, interesting results. But uh, I think that to get, to get introduced to the field, it's a, it's a good uh, um, example. And um, OK, so what did I want to say about that? Um, yeah, I, I, I won't uh, get to the details of uh, techniques, so I, I will try to uh, give the main ideas of the approach, but uh, I will not uh, go to the technical details of, uh, for instance, regularity estimates and so on. But uh, if you're interested to know more, uh, on my webpage I have um, le some lecture notes where uh, I I mean, uh, it's not exactly about this time varying environments, but uh, you can find some material on that, on the type of estimates that we, 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 we develop for type this, this type of models. Okay? So, and before going to, to the study, I would like to give also some other references. Um, this group of references that I have written here are mostly um, uh, articles in uh, theoretical biology. Uh, and uh, most of them in 1990s, and the one in 2014 is, uh, is a review. And, um, okay, so what they did in, this, in those works is that they really considered a part particular case where we have uh, a quadratic growth rate, and um, the environment would change only this uh, theta, okay? So the optimal trait. So they had some restrictive assumptions. And um, in this case, at least if we start, if you really consider this model uh, with a diffusion, and, and if you start with the Gaussian distribution, the solution would remain Gaussian, okay? 
and then the, the uh, analysis are easier. And what the biologists do is that um, they actually don't really care about the model they consider, but they usually, uh, I mean, it can be sexual, asexual, and it can be uh, other models, but uh, they always assume that their distribution is a Gaussian. And then uh, they do uh, some analysis on the, uh, uh, on the moments of the Gaussian distribution, and they obtain some results uh, on the uh, quantities that are interesting for them. Okay, so what we do here is that we try to compute the, the quantities that uh, they were looking to compute, but we try to do it in a more general uh, um, context where we don't uh, necessarily have Gaussian distributions and we don't necessarily have, uh, um, the, the influence of environment is not necessary on the uh, necessarily on the only the optimal trait, and we will see that this is actually an important assumption that uh, misses some type of uh, behaviors of the solution. If we uh, change other parameters of the model, we could obtain a, a richer, um, uh, more type of behaviors. Okay? And there have been actually a lot of works recently on these type of uh, um, selection mutation models in time varying environments, considering uh, different questions and different scalings, um, maybe, um, and also different type of reproduction, for instance, sexual reproduction. Uh, what I wanted to say uh, is, um, is that it, it also is, uh, these type of questions also appear in a uh, works where we look for an, an optimal therapy for cancer, for instance, because in cancer, of course, the problem is that when you uh, treat the patient, after some time the uh, uh, cancer cells become resistant to the, uh, to the treatment and then the uh, cancer starts over and uh, starts again and, and the an important problem is how to uh, treat the patients so that we avoid the emergence of resistance to, uh, to these uh, medications. And then when we have medication in the, uh, uh, administered to the cells, it's like that we are changing their environments. Okay, so, so the medication is uh, an environmental variable. And now we have, uh, we choose how to change it, okay? And uh, so a question that uh, naturally appears is, the, uh, is to find the, to an optimization, optimization problem, how to obtain an optimal treatment to, uh, in order to avoid uh, resistance. And, it is, uh, and uh, there have been a s some, uh, a group of force on these type of uh, questions and the models are very related to what uh, we, we see here. Okay. Okay, so um, now I would like to uh, begin with uh, the case of shifting environment and to see uh, what we can uh, do uh, in uh, what we can say on the behavior of the solution. Okay, so so this is a uh, so this is the main model that we will focus on. And uh, so we will consider a shifting environment. So, so that we have R of Z minus CT here, okay? And, um, okay, so we want to study uh, this equation. And uh, what we will do is that we will first uh, study the long time behavior of uh, the solution such a, to such an equation. And then uh, once we know at uh, in long time what is the 
long time solution, then we will try to describe uh, the long time solution, uh, the, the um, properties of this long time solution. Okay, and um, the thing is that this term z minus ct is uh, bothering us because it's a non local term and uh, it's not a classical object. So, what we will do is that we will um, put things in a moving framework. So, we will define n of t and z to be m of t and z plus ct. Okay, so we are uh, moving our framework to move with the change of the environment. And uh, when we, s we put n of t and z is m of t and z plus ct, then uh, dt of n would be dt of m plus c dz m. Okay, so this, uh, this term uh, would be uh, um, uh, added. And then with respect to n, we will have the same uh, terms. Okay, so we put these things in this equation and we will obtain an equation on n which will be uh, uh, the same equation but we won't have any more this z minus ct so we will get rid of this and we will have the n and we will have this a term that comes from this that is minus c d over dz of n okay and I replace everything by n and capital N is the size of the population okay so uh, from now on we will concentrate on this equation which is nicer okay and uh, what are assumptions? So we will assume that R is a smooth function. So what this is uh, actually something that I had written here. Uh, um, that it goes to minus infinity at, plus at, uh, at infinity. And uh, we also assume that it is bounded from above and its maximum is attained at a unique point. Okay? So... There exists a unique maximum point Zm such that R takes its maximum here. So this is Z and this is R. And also there exists a unique Z bar at the left of Zm such that <coughs> this uh, difference between R of Z bar and R of Zm is given by C squared over 4 sigma. Okay? And then we could have uh, different behaviors here and we could have uh, the solution that comes up here. At the right, we will have this line that can cross the graph of R several times, but at left, there should be just one point. Okay? Okay, so these are assu our assumptions. And um, under these assumptions, we will study uh, the behavior of the solution. And yes? Yes. Yes. C is positive. Thank you. Of course, so you can also switch. It's just a. Uh, um, I don't find my words. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's why yeah, yeah. Sure. Right. Yes, of course, if it, it was negative, it would be, have been at the right. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so to uh, be able to describe the long time behavior of the solution, we will have to introduce some eigenvalue problems. Okay, so a first eigenvalue problem is uh, when we uh, take c equal to zero, so we forget about this, and of course we, are, we um, uh, let uh, this uh, 
Uh, I mean, we don't take into I mean, let me write. So there are some eigenvalue problems that are important in the analysis. The first one is when C is zero, and the second one is when C is positive. And uh, the first problem is minus sigma squared, uh, second derivative of P, minus R of Z, uh, P sigma zero. And this would be equal to some eigenvalue times P sigma zero. And we are looking for a positive uh, eigenfunction. Okay? And um, since we assume that R was going to minus infinity at infinity, uh, this operator has a, a compact resolvent. So we can apply the crane rutman theorem, and we know that uh, there exists a principal eigenpair, lambda sigma zero and p sigma zero, such that p sigma zero doesn't change sign. Okay, and p sigma zero would be uh, 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 we will uh, t um, uh, take it positive. Okay, and of course. Uh, to have uniqueness, we have a renormalization, a normalization that here is the, for instance, the L2 norm has to be equal to one. Okay. So this is a first eigenvalue problem. There is also a second one, where it is, this is eigenvalue problem for C equal to zero and C equal C greater than zero, and for C greater than zero, we have uh, the same uh, problem, but with the C uh, which appears as well. And I will uh, um, okay. I'm sorry. Minus d2 dz squared p sigma c minus r of z p sigma c is lambda sigma c p sigma c. Okay. So this is also uh, an operator with compact resolvent, and it has also a principal eigenpair. But there is indeed a relation between uh, the eigenvalues of this operator and this operator, okay? And we can see that, actually, if we perform a Liouville transformation on P sigma C, uh, that is, we write Q of Z is equal to this uh, P sigma C of Z <coughs> times exponential C over two sigma Z. And we put this in this equation, we would have uh, this, uh, okay, you see that uh, d over dz of q would give you c over 2 sigma p sigma c times exponential c 2 sigma z, z and uh, plus dz p sigma c exponential of c 2 sigma z. And if you differentiate twice, you would have C2 C squared over 4 sigma squared plus dz z p sigma plus C over 2 sigma, two sigma uh, dz p, C, p sigma. all of this times exponential term. And if we put this in the equation on PC, Z, uh, PC, PC sigma, we would obtain this equation on Q. So we see that uh, now Q is an eigenfunction of the first operator with this uh, additional constant minus C squared over four sigma. Uh, and there is probably, 
Uh, okay, uh, uh, is there a sigma squared missing or, or not? Um, no, no, it's not missing because we are mi multiplying this by sigma, okay? So it is really uh, sigma c squared over 4 sigma, okay? And now, so we obtain this relation between lambda c sigma c and lambda sigma 0. And, uh, okay, and uh, now we are able to see, to say what would be the behavior of the solution in long time. And to do, that, to do that, we will define a critical speed that depends on lambda sigma zero. So it is given by uh, this uh, C sigma that I have written here. If lambda sigma zero is negative, then uh, if, it's if it is positive, then C sigma is zero. And if it is, uh, if it is negative, then uh, lambda sigma is, uh, C sigma is given by this two square root of minus sigma lambda sigma zero. Okay? And, um, okay, once we have this threshold, uh, we can uh, give the behavior of the solution. We can show that if C is less greater than C sigma, N of T would converge to zero. And if C is less than C sigma, N of T would converge to uh, the principal eigenvalue, uh, I mean, little n with a conversion to a renormalized principal eigen, uh, eigen function uh, of the problem. And actually, you see that uh, at least uh, formally, if we expect that in this equation n of t converge to some uh, constant n, If n of t converge to that, then and the dt of n disappears, at least formally, we would have a c dz uh, n tilde, which is the final state, uh, d to n uh, dz squared of n is equal to n times r minus kappa n times n. And uh, here, now this is a constant, and n tilde is uh, supposed to be positive, so we see that uh, if we have a limit, then this limit is, uh, solves the eigenvalue problem, okay? So it solves the eigenvalue problem, and this kappa n would be uh, nothing but, uh, to, uh, uh, kappa n would be equal to lambda sigma c, and this n tilde uh, would be at least, uh, um, so when we renormalize it, it would be uh, close to P sigma, C sigma. So actually it would be uh, renormalized in a way such that uh, its, it's a size, its a integral is equal to capital N. So it would be uh, lambda sigma C over kappa over integral of C P sigma C, okay? So this is, uh, of course, what we expect. And we see already that, okay, if we have a solution at the limit, then uh, if uh, at the limit we don't have extinction and the solution goes to a positive value, then this has to be, uh, okay, so this ka kappa n is minus lambda sigma C, okay? because lambda sigma c had a positive sign over there. And we see that uh, to have a limit that makes sense, this has to be positive. So this is why if lambda sigma c is positive, we have extinction. Okay, so this is uh, natural. And if it is negative, then it is possible to have a, there exists a, uh, a solution to the limit problem. And we show that we, the solution converged to that indeed. And um, a final remark is that, uh, okay, so we write this lambda sigma c 
as a function of lambda sigma zero, lambda sigma c was given by lambda sigma zero plus c squared over four sigma. And we see that, uh, okay, if lambda sigma zero is positive, this would be always positive. So there will be always extinction for any C. So even without any environmental change, we don't expect to have survival of the population. And uh, so to have survival, lambda sigma zero has to be uh, negative. And then we can go up until uh, this value ta uh, takes the value zero, okay? So when we put lambda sigma zero plus C squared over four sigma equal to zero, this would give, give us the critical speed, which is given by the square root of uh, minus lambda sigma zero, um, uh, sigma times two, okay? So this is where the critical speed comes from. Okay, and actually uh, once uh, we write things like this, the proof is not very difficult. Um, we can prove uh, separately the convergence of uh, little n and capital N. We can first prove the convergence of uh, okay, let me be, uh, show this by this. We can first prove the, proof, uh, the convergence of little n over capital N, which is the normalized function to the uh, principal eigenvalue, and this is based on a sp the spectral gap that we have in the prob the, uh, for the operator. And once we have this, then we can, uh, once we have this convergence, then we can then uh, prove the convergence of capital N. So it, is, it can be uh, done by an easy exercise that I left it to you. Okay, so the, and the lemma, uh, uh, in what follows, I will replace everything by uh, n, sigma, n sigma bar and n sigma, so here I had the tilde, but it has to be uh, n sigma bar, and uh, I, I drop all the tilde and, and, uh, and the bars to have uh, simple notations, and we will focus on this, uh, on this solution, on this limit uh, solution, which is nothing but the eigenvalue. And I I can function. Yeah, uh, actually, I, I remember now. I wonder what I wanted to say when uh, I was talking about the uh, Hamilton-Jacobi approach. Okay, so this is um, um, but, um, many things that I'm um, discussing today, especially in this case of uh, shifting environments. Um, where we have a real uh, eigenvalue problem. Uh, these are very related to other problems in, um, for instance, in Schrodinger theory and uh, in, the, uh, in the study of Schrodinger equation. And uh, in general, the Hamilton-Jacobi approach that I will introduce after this part. Um, it is an approach that has been uh, uh, it's used in different contexts, of course, di uh, by different uh, uh, differences that uh, to adapt to the uh, context. A very close um, uh, field where this approach has been used is in the study of propagation from phenomena. Uh, when uh, actually we would, you could have very uh, similar questions to what I. Uh, I'm showing today in the case of Fisher KPP equation, where we have a, um, instead of a genetic uh, distribution, you have a spatial distribution and you have a growth rate. And the difference is that you don't have um, an integral term in the death term, you have a local term. And uh, this describes the uh, dispersion of uh, individuals. And uh, on those type of models, you have uh, some propagation phenomena, some traveling fronts, for instance, while in um, selection mutation models, we have concentration phenomena, and w we will see this uh, a little bit later. Of course, under some assumptions, not in general, but in the assumptions that I will make, we will have some concentration phenomena, and the Hamilton-Jacobi approach is in, within this uh, 
uh, context uh, where we obtain this concentration phenomenon. And this hamilton jacobi approach was already used to study uh, this um, uh, propagation phenomena in uh, the works of Friedlin from a probabilistic point of view related to large deviations and also by uh, Evans and Suganidis, uh, but also afterwards many other authors. Okay, so it's all the works in the 80s. I am not sure about the, the years, maybe 80, 88 for this and 85, 86, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, okay, and uh, so the approach is very related to, to, to those works and it can be used to study the propagation phenomena, but it is also related, for instance, to the uh, semi-classical uh, analysis of the Schrodinger equation, okay? Okay. So, uh, let's go back to, to our problem. Um, so now uh, we know that in long time we will have a solution. Uh, okay, so I have two n here. So I drop this and I forget about the tildes. Okay, so we have a steady state, which is indeed a Nagin function. Uh, and we a question is okay, how how can we describe this Eigen function? Okay, what is uh, the, uh, what does it look like? And to be able to say something on that, we will make some assumption, that is, that the mutations have a small effects. And uh, for that, I will replace my sigma by epsilon squared, where epsilon is a small variable. Okay, so I'm considering uh, a small mutation step. But I should be careful because when in this problem, in this problem, if sigma is a small, then uh, lambda sigma zero would be still order of one. So if this is epsilon squared, this would be depending on epsilon. We can show that this lambda epsilon zero with respect to epsilon would be of O of one, but uh, our critical speed, there is a sigma in it, okay? And this critical speed will, will be of O of epsilon, okay? So it means that if we have uh, a little a small genetic, um, a, s a small mutational variance, this will induce a small genetic uh, variance in the population. And uh, when we have a small genetic variance in the population, we have a slow evolutionary dynamics because we need this genetic variance to evolve, okay, to go to the better trace and to adapt to the environment. But if the genetic variance is small, we cannot adapt much in a small time. So this is because, this is why our critical speed would depend on epsilon and it would be uh, O of epsilon. So to be able to have a, have a positive solution, non-extinction, we will also put an epsilon in front of C and uh, we, re we will renormalize the critical speed and the, C the, the speed of the environment so that uh, we, we are in a context where uh, the population will not... Uh, so my, my objective is to take this C constant, but let epsilon go to zero, okay? If I don't do it, then all the time the population will go extinct, okay? So I have to put this C here so that I have actually uh, a population. And um, then, uh, so we have this new problem, so everything depends on n, on epsilon, okay? And now we want to describe our n epsilon with respect to epsilon. Okay, 
So uh, when uh, now because we made this uh, assumption of small mutational variance, we have this concentration phenomenon that I was talking about. And uh, what we will have, what we will be able to prove is that this phenotypic density will indeed concentrate on a single point that is uh, our z-bar. Okay, just uh, to remind you what was z-bar. So Z bar, so R had a form like this. Okay, so this is some R. This is ZM, the maximum point. And Z bar is something here. And here we had a difference with C squared over 4 sigma. But um, uh, we we put eps, uh, sigma like epsilon squared. We renormalized re things, so sigma is epsilon squared, and c was replaced by epsilon c. So what we will have is that uh, this is uh, now with new notation is c squared over four. Okay. So what we are saying is that. What will happen is that when the, the um, mutational variance is small, the population will concentrate around this point Z bar. Okay, so what does this mean? When there is no environmental shift, what we would have had is that the population would concentrate on this point Zm, which is the optimal trait in the population. It has the best growth rate. And if we didn't have the environmental shift, the population would concentrate on, the on this. But because we have this environmental shift that, uh, uh, that is with a constant speed, we will always be concentrated on a point which is uh, on a point behind. Okay, just remember that we are in a moving frame. Okay, so this, uh, everything is moving with a speed C. So this is everything going uh, to the right. So the optimal trait is going to the right. And the population is constantly trying to adapt to the right, but it can never catch the, the best trait, Zm. It will always be concentrated behind, around the point Z bar, but it will keep a constant lag. And this lag is given by such that uh, the difference of growth rate is given by C squared over 4. Okay? Okay, now uh, how can we obtain such type of, uh, how can we capture such type of behavior, such type of results? Um, to do that, so as we said, is that uh, when epsilon goes to zero, this distribution will go to a Dirac mass, so it would be singular. So it is not a very nice object. So the main uh, idea in the hamilton jacobi approach is to make a transformation to make the solution nicer, okay? So we have, a, a, so in here in a black, we have a, the distribution and epsilon, and uh, in red, we have minus u epsilon. Okay, so I didn't say what is u. So we, we see that this, uh, bla okay, and black is the phenotypic density where epsilon is small, it's rather peak distribution. So the idea is to make this half cold transformation, that is to write an epsilon equal one over square root of two p epsilon times exponential of u epsilon over epsilon, okay? And actually, we would expect to have uh, an asymptotic expansion for u epsilon. Uh, and uh, at the limit, at least in general, what we can do is that to prove that u epsilon would converge to a function that is uh, smooth, uh, that is at least continuous, and uh, so it is much nicer than a Dirac, okay? So the idea is that, is that we unfold this angularity, so we, instead of studying this uh, peak distribution, we will uh, study the red curve uh, which corresponds to U. 
Okay. Okay, so let's uh, put this in the equation and see uh, what it will give. Okay, so we are um, starting from an equation, from this equation, okay, and we are putting the half coil transformation into this, and the half coil transformation is given by uh, a constant times exponential of u epsilon over epsilon, so we can obtain... Uh -uh computes the derivatives of n in terms of u and this will give us dz u epsilon over epsilon times n epsilon. We can also compute the second derivative of an epsilon and this will give us a diffusion term in u epsilon plus a gradient squared over epsilon squared times an epsilon. Okay? And then we put this in the equation over there and we will have minus C, uh, minus epsilon C uh, dz u epsilon over epsilon minus epsilon squared over dz z u epsilon over epsilon plus dz u epsilon squared squared over epsilon squared and everything time an epsilon is equal to an epsilon times r minus kappa capital n epsilon okay so first of all we can drop these in epsilons and forget about this epsilon and this Epsilon squared will also go away. So I will have just dzu squared and an epsilon times dzu, dzzu epsilon. Okay? So this is the equation that I obtain on u epsilon. Okay. Um, so... Uh, this is the equation that uh, I obtain uh, on u epsilon, and at least formally, I can pass to the limit. If I could pass to the limit, the, what I obtain is minus c dzu plus dzu squared is equal to r minus kappa n. Okay. Um, and this I can write it... Uh, Differently, I can put this into this to have a minus d, so this is minus dzu plus c, of c over 2 squared, and then it will, I will have a minus c squared over 4 that appears in the equation, okay? So I just rewrote uh, the equation, okay? And this is something that actually we prove. So we prove that uh, an epsilon indeed converges to some constant n0. Okay, so this is not difficult if an epsilon is uniformly bonded, for instance, it would converge to a constant. But that u epsilon also converges locally uniformly for the moment along subsequences um, to a solution to this Hamilton Jacobi equation. But uh, uh, we can only pass to the limit in the viscosity sense. Um, uh, uh, until when I, I'm supposed to talk? 10.45. Okay, it's already 10. <laughs> okay, so I'm actually being much uh, slower than uh, what I thought. Um, okay. So let's, for the moment, uh, forget what uh, 
is this viscosity solution and just discuss what uh, we obtain in this uh, theorem. So what we obtain is that uh, this, uh, so we have this uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation, so this is a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, so this is why uh, the name of the approach, where the name of approach comes from. And uh, we don't only have a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, but it is coupled with a constraint that is maximum of u is equal to zero, okay? And um, this would allow us to identify the function u. So this is a well-posed problem, and it will allow us a little bit later to describe, to characterize u in a unique way. But the constraint is necessary, and without that, we want to, of course, have a have a uh, uniqueness, we see that uh, we can uh, add by a constant and uh, we would have always this another solution. And, um, okay, so we will see a little bit later how to describe, how, how to characterize the solution of this Hamilton-Jacobi equation, but what is the, um, uh, wh why is it useful to know what is u? Uh, what is its relation with uh, the density, phenotypic density, which was our bi biological quantity. And it is uh, the main uh, property, the main relation between those two things, this, this inclusion property that says that the spot of n is included in the zeros of u. In particular, if this set of zeros of u is only a single point, we will obtain uh, immediately that n is a Dirac mass at that point. And this is what will happen here, okay? And uh, what we will see is that u is indeed uh, having its maximum at a single point, and the single point is indeed the point that bar, and this is why n would be a Dirac mass at that point, okay? Okay, so um, I have to decide how to, I mean, what to say and what not to say. Um, <coughs> let me first say, uh, so we saw at least formally where the Hamilton-Jacobi equation comes from. I haven't told you yet what is a viscosity solution for those of you who doesn't know, who don't know. Uh, we will see if um, uh, I will be able to say about something about that. But uh, for the moment, let's focus on this max of u equal to zero and uh, the um, inclusion property. So, uh, where this maximum comes from? We know that an epsilon was an equal to one over a square root of two pi epsilon, exponential of u epsilon over epsilon. And we know that the integral of an epsilon, dz, is equal to capital N epsilon, okay? And let's suppose that we know already that an, uh, it, this capital N epsilon is bounded between the two constants. Which are positive. But, and we know, uh, let's uh, admit that u epsilon converges to some function u of z. Okay? If this u epsilon converges, at the, uh, first of all, we say that u cannot be positive because if u is positive at, at some point, if u of z naught is positive, then it is a continuous function, it would be positive on an interval and we have a uniform convergence of u epsilon to u uniform so this means that u epsilon of z would be a greater than a certain constant. If this is greater than a, this would be greater than a half. If epsilon is a small and uh, it's less than a sum sum epsilon naught and z close to z naught. Okay? On a certain interval around z naught, we will have that u epsilon would uh, be a greater than a half, which is positive. And now we will have that exponential of 
in this integral, we will have exponential of a over epsilon taken over an, an interval, okay? Which is a small, but it is a finite interval, okay? And we see that this would go to plus infinity, okay? This would go to a plus infinity, so this would be in contradiction with this bound, okay? So, so far we saw that u of z has to be a uh, negative. And uh, to prove that the maximum of u is equal to zero, we will obtain, we will use this other inequality. Okay. Let's for the moment mm, suppose that uh, we didn't have the integral over r, but over an interval. Okay. If max of u, so assume by contrary that max of u is negative, and the uh, domain is an interval, then we will have exponential of u epsilon over epsilon, which converts to some u, which is a strictly negative everywhere, so it is less than some con constant minus a. And again, with the same uh, reason, u epsilon of z for epsilon is small and z close to, z to and for every z and for epsilon is small, we will have this is less than minus a half and we will have a uh, integral of exponential of minus a half uh, a over two epsilon dz and this will go to zero. And which is in contradiction with this inequality. Um, to uh, deduce the result for the real problem, which is in R, um, actually we can ha have this uh, um, uh, result in R, but uh, to have a contradiction, we should also show that uh, there is no mass that goes to infinity. So the, the thing is that we know that an epsilon remains uh, bounded uh, from below, but to have a contradiction, we should show that uh, there is not, uh, the population is not uh, moving to infinity, uh, because in, if it is moving to infinity, there is no contradiction. So to do that, we have to find some uh, estimates on epsilon, and we actually can uh, show that u epsilon is bounded, for instance, by a, uh, by a um, linear function, negative linear function. So we have uh, exponential decay for an epsilon. So we know that there's no mass that goes to infinity. So there is indeed a contradiction if maximum of u was not zero, okay? So this is where the maximum comes from. And uh, <coughs> the second property, which is very related, is uh, the inclusion property. That the support of n is included in the zeros of u, in the set of zeros of u. And this is indeed, uh, uh, com uh, comes from the same reasoning that uh, if z is in the support of n, if z naught is in the support of n, it is not possible that u of z naught be negative. Because we have again exponential of u 
epsilon over epsilon, which was equal to an epsilon. And if u is negative, in the neighborhood of this, it would be negative and it will converge to zero in the neighborhood of that zero. Okay? So for the, this is for the same reason, we have this property. Okay? So, um, okay, uh, let me, uh, um, I actually wanted to at least briefly talk a little bit about viscosity solutions. Uh, we were actually discussing with Regis here that uh, um, it's somehow strange that people know very well uh, weak solutions in the sublet spaces, but uh, viscosity solutions are not uh, so known, while, while the concept is not that uh, complicated. And um, so it's another notion of weak solution that appears uh, very naturally for hamilton jacobi equations, for instance. And um, so I decided that I, wanted, I didn't want to contribute to that uh, uh, anymore, and I, want to, I don't want to hide what is a viscosity solution, so I will tell you what is a viscosity solution, but maybe it's uh, um, a little bit late to do that, because I know that when I was uh, following the talks, um, the last half an hour I wasn't uh, just able to concentrate on anything, so I don't think that it would be a good time to talk about that. Um, so I will try to uh, go further for the moment, we will admit, okay, we will just, actually, usually when I have viscosity solutions, I say, let's suppose that you have a smooth solution or classical solution and uh, it, it wouldn't bother. And the thing is that here, you can actually suppose that because we will show that the solution is indeed classical. So we prove that we have a convergence to a viscosity solution but in a, but we are in a very rare situation where the solution is indeed classical. Usually Hamilton-Jacobi equations don't have, uh, the solution are not usually classical, they're not uh, smooth. But here, this is the case. So you can actually assume that this is classical. Okay. Um, so. Um, so the idea in this hamilton jacobi approach is, in general, you start from this half course transformation, you let, uh, so you have this auxiliary function u epsilon, you show that it goes to a hamilton jacobi equation, to the solution of hamilton jacobi equation, and then uh, if you're lucky, you can uh, whether solve the hamilton jacobi equation, this is very rare, and uh, if you're not lucky, uh, well, you, you, you don't solve it, but you obtain some information in it. And what you really need is these maximum points of u, where u is equal to zero, because usually what you're interested in is the support of n, okay? So, but we are in a lucky situation where we can actually solve our equation, and we can prove that uh, this uh, function u is indeed uh, uh, given by this explicit formula. Okay, and um, so the solution to this Hamilton-Jacobi equation with constraint is indeed unique at, and it is given by this uh, formula. And this formula, you can verify that it is a actu actually a smooth function. It's a, this is a smooth function. It is uh, differentiable everywhere if R is, uh, is smooth. And um, what and something that you can verify is that the, the function u given by this formula has its maximum at the point z bar, the famous point z bar that we had here. Uh, very rapidly, you can at least verify that u of z bar is equal to zero. If you put z equal to z bar, it is trivial. You can also easily show that its derivative is equal to zero, but this is indeed a maximum point, and this, is, this can be verified, okay? So once we have this, we are done, because we have shown that uh, our solution, our phenotypic density, is indeed uh, concentrated at the point Z bar, okay? So I had uh, planned to 
show you. I think that it is interesting to see why, but again, uh, it is too late to, to show that today. So I will uh, come back to this uh, the next time. And uh, <coughs> I uh, go forward and um, okay. So here we are actually in a even a, a better situation where we can go to the next uh, orders and we can also obtain some uh, asymptotic expansions for, for instance, for the uh, um, total population size and this critical speed C epsilon, uh, which are given by this formula. And actually, it is not very surprising that we have this. This is um, because, I mean, this very simple example, we have really uh, an eigenvalue problem, which is very well known. And, um, and uh, actually, uh, so, if, so everything comes from this. C epsilon is, uh, so the C epsilon is uh, given, uh, is a formula uh, which involves lambda epsilon zero. And an epsilon is also involves this eigenvalue. So we have just an eigenvalue of, uh, of this uh, elliptic operator. And uh, with an epsilon squared uh, in front of this. And actually, uh, we can uh, have an asymptotic expansion for this eigenvalue, which will lead to the asymptotic expansion for an epsilon and uh, C epsilon. OK? So I, uh, I don't go through the details of that. But maybe in the remaining time, I will try to show you a little bit about the uh, uh, biological properties that we could uh, obtain uh, from this analysis and uh, what uh, we obtain uh, from this approach. I mean, we have already obtained that the solution would concentrate around the point that bar, which is at the left, which is described in this way. So we have a constant lag, lag behind uh, this uh, moving uh, um, uh, optimal trait. And uh, so um, it is also interesting to, I mean, when you discuss with biologists, they, what they really uh, like is to be able to see, say things on the moments of the population distribution and not just uh, uh, the limit when epsilon goes to zero, but to say, to be able to say what is when, when distribution is picked, uh, what can we say on the moments of the population distribution because these are the quantities that generally uh, are more measurable or at least are more, uh, they talk more to the, uh, these are the quantities that they try to estimate in their computations, okay? And uh, actually, uh, again, when you are lucky, we can, I mean, we, you could expect to have even an asymptotic expansion for your uh, U epsilon of Z and uh, have a corrector V of Z that uh, you would obtain by going to the next order terms in the equation. So what you did here, we just keep the zero order term, but you can go further to obtain the corrector. And then you would obtain uh, this function v and uh, an estimate, an approximation of your phenotypic distribution. And this would allow you to uh, obtain some estimates on the moments of uh, your phenotypic distribution. So the quantities that we will uh, have here, so capital and epsilon was already there, so it's the total popula population size. We also define mu epsilon to be the mean phenotypic trait, which is defined as a mean uh, uh, of a distribution in a natural way. Also the variance of the phenotypic distribution and the third central moment of the phenotypic distribution. So these are the kinds, type of quantities that uh, we try to estimate for biologists. And, uh, and let's say that, okay, if we have uh, all the regularities that we need, such that we have an asymptotic expansion and we have a, um, uh, tailored developments for our functions u and v, then we would be able to estimate these moments. 
using the Laplace method of integration, which is uh, um, this one, which it says that if this function f of z has a single maximum point that is taken at some point z naught, then we can estimate this integral of exponential of f of z over epsilon dz by uh, exponential of its value at z naught over epsilon with the correction of order uh, epsilon or square root of epsilon uh, and with this second derivative of f uh, which appears. So this is the main uh, ingredient and, and then using this formula and then uh, assuming that we have uh, these correctors and these uh, 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 Taylor expansions, some Taylor expansions for u and v at the maximum point where, which <coughs> is the point z bar here, then we can obtain some estimates r, uh, of our moments, okay? In terms of uh, uh, a, b, and c, and d. And um, of course here, um, in our particular example, uh, we can uh, compute what is exactly this A, B, C, and D in terms of the parameters of the model. And let's see uh, what uh, these uh, give uh, in the... Okay, so this is just how we compute things. But uh, the main idea is this um, uh, Laplace uh, method of integration. Um, okay, so what do we get in this case? So I, I'm just taking a quadratic term, but of course you can do, uh, I mean, uh, I didn't, uh, for this particular uh, case of shifting environment, I didn't try to find a, a more complicated, I mean, more complicated formula uh, to obtain the moments. Of course, uh, these are the results that which were known uh, uh, when we assume a Gaussian distribution as a solution, then, um, in this case, uh, this would be the case, and uh, these, are this, these results confirm what was obtained, uh, f assuming that the uh, distribution is Gaussian. But uh, let's see what they mean. So the uh, population size is given by uh, this um, first line. So we have... Uh, I think there is a kappa in front of an epsilon here that I have forgotten. So here I have taken probably kappa equal to one. And uh, so we have uh, uh, this uh, little r, which was the <coughs> maximal gross rate. And, um, okay, I have to find my, ah, here. So this, um, so if every, all the individuals were well adapted to the environment, we would have a uh, little r, which is uh, the maximal growth rate. Because we have the maximal growth rate and the logistic uh, growth rate, then the size of the population would be given by r. If there was no, if everyone was adapted. But the thing is that everyone is not adapted in the population. First of all, because we have mutations. So we have a mutation load that comes from this uh, the fact that because of the mutations, the uh, variant, this is, there is a variance in the distribution, so no, not uh, every people, everybody can be adapted. But um, there is also another load, which is due to the, uh, I'm really not uh, talented with this. Uh, okay, so this is uh, C squared over four. This is a load which is due to the environmental shift because the environment is uh, moving constantly, the population, is penalized, the population size is penalized because of that, and the quantity that is penalized is c squared over four. Okay, and uh, the phenotypic uh, mean is uh, given by this formula. So uh, there's no epsilon of the term. Uh, and uh, it is given by minus c over two, two square root of s. So remember that c is the environment speed and S is the selection pressure. So we see that if the selection pressure is stronger, then this lag is smaller, okay? So the population would be, uh, so, so this is the phenotypic mean and it is compared uh, 
Uh, okay, so here again, I have forgotten that I had a theta. Theta here is equal to zero. So there otherwise there, was, there would be a theta here. Okay, so what we have is that uh, this minus, this c over two square root of s measures how maladapted we are, how far we are from the optimum. Okay, so I have forgotten a theta here. And um, we see that if the selection pressure is strong, then this quantity is small, so the population is better adapted, so uh, definitive mean is closer to the optimum. And um, another quantity that I wanted to comment is this um, um, speed of change of environment, that threshold of uh, speed change, which is given by this formula, two square root of r minus square root of r s over r times epsilon. And now we see that if epsilon is, a is if s is uh, large, then we have a uh, large negative term, which means that it will uh, decrease the threshold above which uh, the population will go extinct. Okay, so it's not good. When when the when c epsilon is smaller, it means that uh, uh, if the the, the environment uh, change. Um, I mean, the environment change uh, is more critical uh, for the population to survive. It, if it is decreasing, it means that the population will uh, more difficultly adapt uh, to the environment. So we see that this selection pressure has two uh, uh, opposite uh, effects. It can reduce the phenotypic lag, but in the same time, it can uh, de uh, decrease the um, the critical speed of survival. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the type of information that uh, at the end uh, are interesting uh, to discuss uh, with biologists. And uh, okay. So um, an assumption that I made was that. Uh, R of z would go to minus infinity at z goes to infinity. So I, I had a real confining uh, uh, growth rate. But uh, this is actually not necessary for the computations to hold. We can relax this assumption and uh, everything would work. And um, we can actually replace the assumption by this. So what we can say is that uh, we can actually uh, consider some growth rate that uh, is bounded, but it takes negative values at infinity, negative enough values at infinity. So this is z, this is r of z. And we can also consider this type of <coughs> growth rates, okay? And it can also. Uh, not be just quadratic and more complex, okay? And ev all the computations would work, but the assumption that is important to hold is that this C has to verify this condition, that R of Z is strictly less than R of Z M uh, minus C squared over four. So remember that this is Z M, and R of Z M minus C squared over four was R of Z bar. So Z bar was given such that we have this. So if we have we uh, draw a line which takes this value, R of Z bar, of course, I mean, and this has should be true for Z uh, uh, large. Okay, so for Z large, we should have uh, this. And, um, and this makes sense because uh, if this becomes, uh, so it means that this line has to be uh, greater strictly than this line. And of course, if it decreases, then there is no Z bar anymore for the population to concentrate on. So it makes sense that the computations would not work in that case if Z bar crosses this, so if the line crosses this, so there's no candidate for Z bar, so uh, there would be something that happens that is uh, 
that makes that the analysis wouldn't work. And the thing is that in that case we won't have a, we will have a, uh, we won't have these principal eigen functions. And um, so a question is that okay, so let's study a case where we have this this type of R, and then. Um, Okay, I don't know if I had the C critical already. If I had one, this is not the same. <laughs> it's a new critical C. And uh, it is uh, given by this formula that mean of R of Z is equal to R of Z M minus C critical squared over four, okay? So it is the critical speed, which makes that these two lines would be uh, uh, the same, okay? So this is where the uh, theory doesn't work anymore. And uh, a question is, what happens then? <coughs> uh, in this case, so we can, uh, as I said before, in every, uh, for every C before this, uh, uh, this uh, speed, uh, we can all make all these computations and we can uh, obtain our formula and um, here I have taken an example of R of Z that has like indeed this, uh, uh, this uh, behavior. And actually R shouldn't be negative. I, this is not, a, I mean, the, the real condition is this. I, I made a mistake. I said that R has to be negative at the infinity, but this is not true. It hasn't, it shouldn't be negative. It can be also positive and everything works, but uh, we should have this condition. And in this case, we can compute all, uh, our parameters and uh, see what happens when C goes to this C critical. And what we obtain is that at this C critical, for this particular example, we will have that the population density remains bounded and uh, from below and above, so it goes just to a constant R over two. But all the other quantities explode so mu epsilon goes to minus infinity, which makes sense because when we come uh, closer to this, here z bar is here, but when we get close to this, z bar will go uh, away more and more, and at the end it will go to minus infinity. The variance is going to infinity, and the third central moment is going to minus infinity, which means that the population is going the more and more to the, to the left of you. Okay? And this is actually a situation which is known as a, what we call a, a, an evolutionary tipping point. Why is it uh, particular is that before this critical speed, the population size remains uh, away from zero, okay? So the population size is uh, still positive <coughs> and not close to zero if R is, uh, is not small, but when uh, we, uh, we are here, when we are here, C is here, everything is fine, but C is here, the population gets uh, collapsed. Uh, and this is uh, what is a phenomenon that is well known in, in uh, ecology and uh, the, the fact that you have uh, a gradual change of the environment and uh, before a uh, slight change, uh, everything seems okay, and then after a slight change, we see that, okay, the population uh, collapses, and of course, it's a, it's a bad thing because we cannot uh, predict uh, that is, uh, it is occurring. And we see that when we have this type of growth rates, uh, we can see uh, such type of theory. Of course, uh, uh, this is a very simplified model, and I'm not really saying that uh, I'm detecting a real uh, evolutionary tipping point in ecology. And of course, if you really re inter are interested in the extinction phenomenon, then when you get close to extinction, then you have to switch to probabilistic methods, models, okay? But it gives at least some ideas on uh, this type of situation. And uh, I will stop here for today. Okay.
Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, let me just to get to, uh, if I'm sure, the, you, uh, are you talking about the biological experiment or not? Yeah, okay. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it represents the network, right? Mm -hmm. But if I understand it, it would represent two different phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, on the I have a population with many bacteria that live for a long time and have very little offspring. Mm -hmm. And another where a lot of bacteria would die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in this kind of experiment, what we expect that we are in the second scenario mm -hmm. when you would take out the bacteria that remain, mm -hmm. they have a higher growth rate because they have this habit of uh, reproducing at a high rate. <laughs> so, these two phenomena can you okay. see them in, in your model? Um, yeah, I think that there's, a, there's an important uh, fact in uh, your comments is that the scaling is very important. And um, in, um, in my model, for the moment, I mean, I will discuss uh, on Friday about this uh, experiment uh, in particular, but uh, in this first, the first types of model that I wanted to discuss, uh, I suppose that uh, the fluctuations are of order one, and the genetic variance is small. And uh, this makes that uh, the population, uh, and I, I wait for a long time. And uh, this makes that the population in long time would be, uh, uh, would be adapted to a certain, uh, to an average environment. Okay, if, if I do that, when I have a periodic environment, what happens in this scaling, in this scale of uh, parameters, I will have uh, a population that is ab adapted to an average environment. But I can have different scale of parameters, that is, uh, okay, I wait for a long time, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the oscillations are not uh, fast, uh, and the population has the time to adapt to such, uh, such an environment. And uh, so the po then if I do that, then the population is not getting adapted to an average environment, but it is somehow adapting uh, instantaneously to every state of the environment. And this would uh, give a very different outcome. The uh, scalings that we consider, well, I mean, how, adaptation, how fast is adaptation with respect to the oscillations of the environment, this will change completely uh, what you would obtain uh, in, um, as a result. Okay, and now is it really, I mean, I don't have this impression that uh, in their experiment there were some bacteria that would go extinct. This didn't seem at least uh, to be the case in that ex particular experiment. But, uh, um, or, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, but um, the thing is that it really, it is indeed very uh, dependent on the assumptions that we make on this case and uh, how, f I mean, uh, how fast the population gets adapted and how fast the environment changes. And uh, it, with different scalings of these, the outcomes would be very different. Now, if, is it, I mean, at least in the case in this parameter uh, scale that I will show on Friday, we, we managed to obtain uh, a situation where we obtain uh, this type of phenomenon. Is it possible to obtain also in other frameworks? Maybe, but uh, we didn't uh, look at that. But the thing is that I don't really know what happens in the experiment because the experiment was done some years ago and the, uh, the data is not uh, um, adapted to this type of question. So. We don't know. Um, so, um, as far as I understand, 
question the, uh, the Laplace method uh, argument, a uh, argument to determine the mass. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so now in the case where you have, let's say, two maxima, mm -hmm. uh, so it is also the case that the, the, the size of the masses uh, that you get at the two maxima is determined by this two argument? Or okay. Uh, yeah, when, when you have two maxima, uh, then what would happen is that, uh, what, so if you have R which has two maxima, I mean, let's forget about the shift because the question is already interesting with we don't have a shift. So when you have a single maximum, you would concentrate on this. But if you have a two maxima, uh, then uh, so the c it's the curvature that determines you where which one of its, uh, I mean, it's... Uh, Yeah. 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 It's a re in this particular case where you have a, mm -hmm. it's a Schrodinger operator, so it's a, everything is similar. Well, I, actually, these are questions are more adapted to my uh, second lecture. Uh, I, I, I don't have a precise uh, answer to that, but I can see that, okay, I take different scalings and I obtain different limits. And then um, uh, which one of them you would obtain. Um, what you can do is that all the computations that I did, I didn't try to show you a dimensionless uh, version of the problem. You can do that and you will reduce the parameters and you, would, you could see, say then after epsilon equal to that, the solution would be close to that. Okay, so, but uh, it is, it would um, be on the, uh, yeah, okay, so we can do such stuff. So we can, when we obtain the limits, it is possible to, to check, uh, to write the problem. It would depend. Uh, uh, in this case, it is really a question of uh, how fast is, uh, I mean, if you don't have the environmental change for the uh, hamilton jacobi approach to work, the main assumption is that uh, when you write things in the dimensionless parameters, uh, it would be translated into the fact that the demographic uh, dynamics is much faster than the evolutionary dynamics. Okay, so it's a, a relationship between uh, the uh, genetic variance and uh, and the selection. And um, so you know that okay, if you are in a situation where I mean, and uh, for particular examples, you can see what would be the threshold where after after which it becomes uh, far from your solution at least numerically. And, uh, okay, so this Hamilton-Jacobi, for the Hamilton-Jacobi approach in the constant environment case to work, this is the main assumption. The real assumption is that the evolutionary dynamics is much slower than the ecological dynamics, which is actually that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, s common assumption, because uh, it's usually uh, the case but not always. But uh, when the environment change comes to the game, it's much more complicated. So it's, uh, we can say that, as we can see uh, that, okay, in this uh, framework, at least we can see that there are different uh, um, situations where the dynamics have different types. But uh, I haven't uh, been, uh, I haven't, I mean, I just have studied uh, like two examples of 
different scales, but I haven't studied all the possibilities. <coughs> but uh, it's already, uh, I mean, uh, at the end it's uh, rather natural, the outcome is rather natural, but uh, I would say that uh, if you want to have a precise answer, you, would, you should have a precise question and a precise model and then discuss about it. It is difficult to say something general and something uh, less general. Uh, we have uh, 30 minutes and we will come to the end of the session. Thank you again.